In today's episode, we are going over a physical therapy guide to plyometrics, return to run, speed, and agility training. Let's get rolling. So why are we talking about this? Well, first and foremost, especially for post-op patients, I think physical therapists do a very good job in the early stages of rehabilitation. And we had a lot of education on how to deal with common orthopedic surgeries. So we do a good job. On the flip side of things, we don't get a lot of education on the end stages of rehabilitation, particularly return to sport. So essentially, if you have a post-op patient and you get a protocol from the surgeon, you usually have some pretty good guidance from that surgeon up until about three to four months, and then you get a lot less guidance. And it's up to the physical therapist to learn how to bridge that gap and get back to high level of a performance for that individual. And this goes for an athlete that's trying to get back to a field sport, but it also goes for the average Joe that maybe wants to get back to some sort of jogging program, or they just want to get back to being able to play pickup sports, like let's say tennis or basketball or soccer or something along those lines, right? And generally speaking, a lot of the advancement of impact activities is not taught in most physical therapy curriculums, right? So we have a lot of questions end up being, when is it even appropriate to start plyometric training? How and when do we transition to some of the impact activity? Also, when we are allowed to start, what do we start with? And how do we progress over the course of time? What's kind of step one, step two, step three, step four, step five? If we are going too fast, how do we know, right? And lastly, I think a big problem is that most information that we have out there is expert opinion. We don't have a lot of clear cut uh, medical research that shows us when we're allowed to start stage one, stage two, stage three, so on and so forth. So in today's episode, we're going to go over when is it okay to start with return to run activities, plyometric activities, right? We're going to talk about progressions. We're going to talk about very easy progressions and how to progress all the way to more advanced return to sport type activities. We'll also talk about how I like to specifically progress each part of impact. So basically, we're going to go with a return to run program first. And this is my foundation for all plyometric based activities. We're going to talk about how to return back to acceleration and sprinting. We're going to talk about how to progress through plyometric and jump training. We'll chat about change of direction and agility work. And lastly, we'll talk about conditioning. So once we've built all of these elements together, right, how do we get someone more conditioned so they can return back to sport their activities over the course of time? Welcome to the Fitness Pain-Free Show. This is where we help coaches and physical therapists like you get your patients out of pain and back to training. My name is Dan Pope. I'm a physical therapist, coach, personal trainer, and meathead. I have my dream job as a physical therapist, coach, business owner, and educator. I've been doing this for several decades now. I want to help you reach your goals, and that's the whole reason why I run fitnesspainfree.com. This is part two on our series of plyometrics and return to running. If you missed part one, I'll leave a link in the show notes. Definitely check that out before you get started on this one. So why do we want to wait a little bit to go back to sprinting, right? Compared to when we start jogging? Well, it's obvious, right? When you sprint, it's just going to be more force through the injury site compared to a jog, right? So it makes sense. We start with jogging and we progress our way to sprinting over the course of time. Okay. Your return to run program is going to build the base for sprinting. And typically I like to do at least four weeks of return to run jogging prior to starting any, any form of sprinting. Okay. And we're talking about sprinting. I actually like to break this down a little bit more. When I think about sprinting, there's two parts of sprinting that I think are important. So one, you have acceleration. So essentially you're starting from zero and accelerating as fast as you can. Okay. Which is a specific type of stress to your body. Then you have top end speed. So essentially once you've gotten through the portion of acceleration, now we're maintaining a very high level speed. It's a different type of stress through the body. So I actually break those down. Okay. So when I'm trying to work on acceleration, I focus on drills like fall runs. So falling forward until you're about to land your face and then just picking up the speed and accelerating quickly. And then when I'm trying to build top end sprint speed. I'll do build up runs. So essentially you're not accelerating very fast. You slowly build up your speed until you're at a high level where you're maintaining that for a period of time. Let's say that's 5, 10, 15 seconds, right? So I actually break those two apart and work on those separately within a training session. So I will say that prior to starting acceleration as well as top-end speed running, 
we have to do a lot of preparation before we begin, right? So largely, if I'm going to start at week 18, at week 16, I'm really starting to um, increase the challenge from general strength training to kind of these bridge the gap type exercises that I can handle things like accelerating top and sprinting. So some of the movements I like to incorporate at week 16 are going to be heavier sled pushes as well as resisted marching. Okay. Now I like these a bunch because generally they're slower. They're not as stressful to the body, but they're going to put you in a very similar position that you need for accelerating as well as sprinting. Okay. So week 16, I'm going to be pushing heavy sled pushes. And at week 18, I think the body's taking enough of that stress. They can start to begin some of the acceleration exercises. In terms of preparing top end sprinting, I'm a huge fan of A, B, and C, marches, skips, and runs. Uh, these are technical drills to work on the basics of sprint mechanics, right? And I've actually made a video that I'll share with you in the show notes to go over the A, the B, and the C skip, uh, just because they're challenging to perform, to learn, and to coach. So I'm going to try to show you how I do it a little bit to help you with your patience. Okay, so look for that in the show notes. Uh, but largely at week 16, I'm starting to incorporate A, B, and C skips and runs, as well as marches, because I think that's going to help prepare my athletes for sprinting. And I'm going to start around week 18. So guys, if you like what you're learning about so far, then I want you to go and check out the fitness pain-free mini course. So I made a mini course. It's absolutely free. That's the next logical step. If you want to learn more from me. So in the course, we go over five lessons. That first lesson is how traditional schooling has failed us, right? So schooling is phenomenal from a physical therapy perspective, but doesn't really teach you how to work with high level athletes in the fitness world, right? doesn't always teach you how to do the lifts appropriately. doesn't teach you about progressions and regressions of common lifts within the gym. doesn't teach you how to program normally, how to write rehab programs or how to write injury prevention programs for these folks. Next thing we go over, seven reasons why people get hurt in the gym, four simple steps to getting your clients out of pain, how to build the career of your dreams and earn the respect of your community. It's all well and good if you know exactly how to work with folks within the gym. But if you can't get these folks through the door on a regular basis, then you're simply not going to be living the dream that you want to because you can't get the patients through the door that you want to work with. Okay, so I'll show you how to do that. And lastly, we'll talk a little bit about the fitness pain free certification, right? So I'll leave a link in the show notes. I definitely recommend checking this out. Once you sign up for the fitness pain free mini course, you will be automatically placed in the wait list for the fitness pain free certification. Now, the Fitness Pain-Free Certification is the course, the certification that I wish I had as a new grad that fills in all the gaps in knowledge that you don't get in physical therapy school. So A, you'll gain complete confidence working with injuries in the strength and fitness world. You'll learn optimal technique for both health and performance from myself and some of the best coaches in the world. You'll master programming for rehabilitation and injury prevention. Have fun while earning a whole bunch of physical therapy and physical therapy assistance credits. You have 31.5 of those. You'll also gain NSCA credits as well as CrossFit credits if you need those. This is the equivalent of a university education in working with injuries in the weight room. I really believe that. I've been adding to this thing over the past five or six years. It's massive, a ton of phenomenal information. And lastly, the biggest goal is just to fill your day with the patients you love working with and building the respect and admiration of the communities you love working with. So I'll leave a link in the show notes, sign up for the fitness pain-free mini course. The certification is open four times per year for one week to enroll into. If you're on the wait list by signing up for the fitness pain-free mini course, I'll alert you when that next enrollment period is open and you can get started. Let's get back to the show now. So how do we introduce acceleration? What does a programming look like once we're able to start accelerating at week 18? So largely going to have my athletes do some form of acceleration two times per week, right? I usually start them off with fall runs. So largely a fall run is starting up nice and tall and leaning forward until you feel like you're about to fall forward. And then you start accelerating. Okay. And I typically start with around 15 meters. So we do our fall run and we run through 15 minutes, or excuse me, meters and decelerate slowly and walk back to the start. Right. I will start my athletes with four to six sets at around a 50 to 60% effort. Right. So one of the things you'll see in the medical literature is that they'll start folks with a sprint, but they'll tell folks to start with a certain percentage intensity. Right. So you'll see 50 percent a lot 
in terms of starting points for folks when they're beginning acceleration as well as sprint work. So that's the same place I start my athletes. Week 19, we're beefing things up slightly. We're still going 15 meters. We're still using the fall runs. I just bumped this up to five to seven sets. Now we're increasing the athlete's perceived intensity. So we go at 60 to 70% effort. Week 20, we bump it up to six to eight sets. We're doing 70 to 80% effort. Week 21, still doing the fall runs, but doing eight plus sets. We're doing 80 to 90% effort, right? Uh, and I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but the way you choose sets and reps is obviously going to vary a lot depending on the sport. It's a lot of nuance here, but I think what you'll see is we're starting with fewer sets, fewer volume, fewer intensity, and just working our way up over the course of time. I like to introduce top end sprinting in the forms of buildup runs. And what a buildup run is, it's a little bit different than a fall run. With a fall run, you're trying to accelerate as fast as you can right from the get-go, right? So think about hitting the gas pedal as hard as you're able to. For a buildup run, think about hitting that gas pedal very slowly and then building up, building up, building up, building up. And once you get to a certain speed, so a higher end speed, you're maintaining that for a period of time. Okay. So at week 18, I'll start off with around four to six sets and I'll have my athletes go 40 to 60 meters. So build up to 50 to 60% effort and maintain that for 40 to 60 meters. All right. Week 19, we just start to uh, speed this up a little bit more. Fifth, or excuse me, five to seven sets, 40 to 60 meters, a 60 to 70% effort. Next week, week 20, we're now doing six to eight sets and we're bumping it up to 60 to 80 meters. So we're going for a longer distance at 70 to 80% effort. And week 21, we just spruce it up a little bit more. We're doing eight plus sets, 40 to 60 meters, 60 to 80 meters, uh, 80 to 90% effort. So you can see over the course of time, we're just increasing the intensity and increasing the volume slowly. And I just really like build up runs for that. Although there's a lot of variation you can choose from. So once we've introduced acceleration, we've built it up to the point where our athletes are doing 90 plus percent of intensity. How do we advance these drills over the course of time? So based on my timeline, this is going to be five plus months. If I have a post-op ACL reconstruction, I'm not going to get them back to actually competing until around month nine. So what are we doing from month five plus up until nine, 10, 11, 12 months for acceleration. Well, generally I start with a fall run, staying up nice and tall on both feet. And over the course of time, I'll progress to a half kneeling start, which just makes it a little bit more challenging for the individual. And eventually we may start in a plank position. Okay. So think about in a push up position, accelerating from there, we're just getting closer and closer to the ground. It's a little tougher for the athlete to overcome gravity just making the movement a little bit more challenging over the course of time. Okay. The other piece, and we'll talk about this in, in later lessons, but we start with acceleration drills, but over the course of time, as we progress into more agility training and change of direction training, we get a lot of acceleration work within those drills. Okay. So eventually we start to phase out some of the acceleration work in favor of change of direction drills, which we'll talk about these a little bit later. Okay. This is no brainer, but you're starting with low effort and going to high effort. Okay. So we're really just trying to go where harder and harder efforts for athlete over the course of time. Okay. So change of direction work naturally contains a lot of acceleration with deceleration, with change of direction, with pivoting, all sorts of good stuff. That's going to be more sport specific. So over the course of time, we want to rehab to be more sport specific. So we start to phase out traditional acceleration work just so we can incorporate more sport specific change of direction activity. How do we advance top and speed work after we've introduced it? So naturally we can just go from shorter to longer distances covered. So maybe you're starting your athletes with 40 yards and progressing to hundred yards over the course of time. We can obviously go from a lower effort to a high effort. Oftentimes my top end speed work eventually becomes track work. So I'm having my athletes perform 100s, 150s, 200s, and eventually a lot of this is actually going to blend into the conditioning work. So we want our athletes conditioned for whatever activities are going back to doing track work is a great way to condition your athletes and simultaneously work on top end speed. So a lot of these variables, just like with acceleration and change of direction work are going to be combined at the end stages of rehabilitation. So how far you advance with your patients is going to bend very largely on the individual, right? And this is going to depend on, let's say the sport, 
So the demands of a sport like soccer are going to be a little bit different than demands of something like American football versus basketball. So we just have to advance people accordingly. The other piece is that this is going to vary a lot based on the position that your athlete is playing. So think about American football, the demands of a wide receiver versus a quarterback, right? So the wide receiver is going to have to do a lot more running than the quarterback is going to be able to do, right? And then we also have to think about the level of competition. So if you have a soccer player that's going to be competing at a pro level, they have to be able to run a lot, okay? So the demands are much higher on that individual compared to, let's say, a middle school athlete, okay? And lastly, you might have the average Joe that wants to get back to some form of soccer recreationally. So they're a weekend warrior. They play, let's say, once a week. The demands of that are going to be entirely different than someone that's going to be playing five, six, seven days per week, right? So just take that into account with your rehabilitation because it has to vary depending on the individual. If you guys enjoyed this lesson and want to learn some more, I have another video for you. It is going to be an evidence-based guide to the treatment of patellofemoral pain. So if you're working with athletes and having a little trouble running, this is a video for you. Check it out. If you guys want to check out the references, I do recommend reading through some of these articles. They were very helpful for me as a clinician. I'll leave a link to all of these in the show notes, and you can check them out. And lastly, thank you so much for your support. You truly allow me to do what I love for a living. If you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that like button, comment, and subscribe to the channel. It helps me out tremendously. If you are listening or watching the podcast version of this, please leave me a positive rating and review. Again, helps me out tremendously. If you want to go that extra step and support me further, consider subscribing to Fitness Pain-Free Insiders. It's a comprehensive educational resource and toolkit for the fitness and rehab professional. Think Netflix, but for trainers and physical therapists. You have premium content from me, very similar to what you're watching right now, but more in-depth. You get updated monthly webinars delivered via me. You have over 100 webinars, ebooks, and complete guides at your disposal. You have access to a private Facebook group to have all your questions answered by me. You can decide upcoming podcast topics. And the best part is you can get started for just a dollar, right? And lastly, you can cancel anytime. If you do cancel, I'll be a little sad, but that's okay. I'll leave a link in the show notes. But if you want to get started right now, head to fitnesspainfree.com, click on the programs link, and then click on Fitness Pain Free Insiders Online Library to get started.